morning, everyone. It's a blessing to be able to gather together for the worship of the Lord uh, via the medium of Facebook Live and this live stream. And I am looking forward to the time when we will be able to worship face to face again on that day. I'm sure many of us will say, along with David, I believe it's in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Uh, by way of announcement, I know I make this announcement every week. We've been making it every week for several months now in regard to um, the donations to the Hands of Mercy Food Bank. Uh, and I know it might get tiresome, but you know what? I eat on a regular basis, and I'm sure that these other people eat on a regular basis as well. So we need to remind ourselves about, about their need. Also, by way of a reminder, once again, um, if you know someone who is not unable to worship on Facebook Live, they can look for us on YouTube, and that video of today's service will be ready by 7 or 7.30 this evening. Also, uh, by way of reminder, once again, uh, you can mail your tithes and offerings here to the church, or you can go to the church's website and make a donation there. Again, it's a blessing to be here and to worship the Lord our God in this way. Amen. to worship for this morning comes to us from the 138th Psalm. David writes there, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning, in worship, we humbly offer up our whole heart, 
and our whole mind and our whole life in praise and thanksgiving to you. Lord, it is right that we adore you. It is right that we praise you and give you thanks. Father, you alone bring us your great salvation. And we praise you for sending your Son to cleanse us from our sins. And we bow down before you. And along with the holy angels in heaven, we say, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. In Christ's name, amen. All right, now we're going to profess and confess what we believe together using the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to say it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Right now we're going to take a prayer request, uh, one that was shared um, just this morning. Please be in prayer for a, a family uh, who has a young man in the family who was placed on suicide watch in the hospital, and they're waiting for a bed uh, in a place where, where he can see receive the care that he needs. So please be in prayer for that family, and I'm sure there are many other people at this time who, uh, with the situation, with the stress of everything that's going on with COVID and job loss, and that are just facing so many things, and we just pray for them that they would seek their foundation in the Lord, and we pray for all of those families in that situation. So let's bow down now before our Lord and our God in prayer. Gracious God, we come before you this morning praising you. Lord, we just want to give you thanks and adore your name and ascribe to you the glory that is due to your name. And Lord, we come and we bow down before you and we humbly conf confess our sins. Lord, we, we, uh, we have faltered so much during this week. We have failed. We have um, just, we're, we're just battered and bruised, Father, and we commit a sin or we fall into a sin, Father, and it grieves our hearts. And Lord, we just come before you now confessing those sins, our lust, our pride, our greed, our, our selfishness, our jealousy, and our covetousness, and Father, our gossip. Father, there are so many ways that we have... Um, failed to love you with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. And so many times we have placed ourselves ahead of love for our neighbor. Lord, we just ask now that you, according to your word, be gracious to us. According to your great compassion, blot out our sins and wash away our iniquities. Father, cleanse us and we will be whiter than snow. Create in us, Father, that clean heart and restore to us the joy of our salvation. Father, we thank you. We thank you that your Son has borne our sins in his body upon the cross and that he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We thank you for that. Lord, we lift up a prayer request to you. Lord, we know that you hear our prayers and that you answer, that you have bid us to come before you in prayer. And Lord, we bring families up who are uh, dealing with suicide. Father, just give them strength and wisdom and courage. Lord, we pray for the health of those around us and our family and our friends and our co-workers. Lord, may, we, may, may they uh, come to know healing through your son, Jesus Christ. And, Lord, just now we pray for the leaders of our nation, our state, and our community. We just ask that you give them wisdom, give them grace, and give them strength. And, Lord, we lift up our, our churches in this nation and in our state and, and here in Kingston, Father. Lord, we just ask that we they would be faithful to proclaim your gospel, 
that we would all boldly tell others of the grace and forgiveness that is found in your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we, we pray for them. We pray now for the salvation of everyone that we know, Father, our friends, our family, our co-workers. Lord, we bring them to, the, to you and ask that they would come to a saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, we as your people ask that we might grow in grace, that we might grow in knowledge, Father, that we may abound more and more in our hearts. Help us to be pure and blameless for the day of your beloved Son's return. Fill us with the fruit of righteousness that comes only through a knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. And now, gracious Father, we close this prayer with the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The song that I'm singing this morning is I'll Fly Away. And I don't know about you, but um, getting through my days have been a little trying. Just the normal stuff. I'm not talking about the catastrophic things that Pastor Dale's been talking about in families or in life. I'm talking about going out to my car and the battery is dead, or trying to turn on the computer to get some work done and the Wi-Fi dies. Just the typical things that make it a little tough. And more than once I've found myself saying, Lord, take me now. And you may have done the same thing. I only half-heartedly mean it. <laughs> God, don't take me now. I've got work to do for you. But times are tough. And I realize that having faith is one thing, but using that faith in these times is a different thing. So what I've decided to do is give people breaks, give myself a break. I don't know about you again, but my memory is starting to fail me a little bit on the minutia of life. Um, and it's the stress coming in. So I'm giving myself a break. I'm not holding people totally accountable like I typically would. I'm trying to be more humorous in my days <laughs> and laugh at the silly stuff that doesn't work. We will get through this. We'll get through this together. We have faith in God, and we, we apply it in our daily lives. Um, so we're going to have fun with this song. So if you want to clap along or be bop with me, we're going to sing I'll Fly Away.
Amen. There is a kingdom coming, and there is a king that will rule, and one day we will be a part of that kingdom where the Wi-Fi won't go down and your batteries won't go dead. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. I'll be reading verses 1 through 7. Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of, of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. For does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But worthless men are like thorns that are thrown away. For they cannot be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of a spear. And they are utterly consumed with fire. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do indeed come before you this morning, and we stand once again before your word. Lord, it is by your word that you teach us, that you you help us to grow in grace. And so, Father, we come now seeking uh, your spirit to do that, to grow us and form us and shape us into the image of your Son. In your name we pray. Amen. Last words, last words. Uh, I think of that, I I think of uh, reading uh, somebody's will. I wonder if you've ever been to the reading of somebody's will. I've never have. I've only seen that on TV or in the movies, you know, you come in and and the lawyer is reading the will and everyone's gathered together and they, you know, and it's something along the lines being of sound mind and body I hereby and then it's just, you know, blah, blah, blah and Everything's laid out, and everybody discovers the wishes of the person who has passed away. And if you think about it, a will is simply the last word from someone before they actually utter their final words. Uh, And that's what we have here in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Verse 1, we read, Now these are the last words of David. But as we read it, we know that that's not the last thing David ever says because there is a chapter 24 and David does some stuff. And so these are the last words, from our, our, but they are not the final word from David. And as David writes, as David speaks these last words, he speaks them with certainty. He speaks them with an air of security and confidence and trust. He speaks them from the foundation of his life, and it is that foundation that gives him purpose, that foundation that gives him meaning. And what is that foundation? Well, the, that foundation is this. It is the covenant promise that God made with David and with David's house. And as David writes these last words, he looks to that promise that God has given to him. And as he writes, God's spirit speaks through him. He speaks as a prophet. As a prophet, David is a king, but here he's speaking as a prophet. And I think he's speaking about Jesus Christ in these verses. I mean, look at verse 5. David references the covenant that God established with him. You can read about that covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And the Lord says to David through Nathan, Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So David's, quote, last words look forward to the final establishment of the kingdom that Beth was singing about that we'll fly away to. That's where we want to go is to that kingdom. And David is writing about that kingdom. He's he's prophesying about the future king, 
Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the fulfillment of the everlasting covenant that God has made with him. And David starts here, he begins his last words, and there, look at verse 1 again. He says, it's the oracle of the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high. Then in verse 2, he says, the spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. Three times, three times in a row, David says, the message is from God, it's not from me. This is the oracle of God. This is the message that's on my tongue from God, the rock of Israel. And that repetition reminded me of a story about a young preacher who got up in the pulpit and he announced his text, you know, by saying, behold, I come. And he said, he said that and then his mind went blank. He couldn't bring up what he planned on saying. So he repeated it. He said, behold, I come. And still nothing came to him. So he leaned into the pulpit as hard as he could. And he said with all the gusto he could, he said, Behold, I come. And he was a rather large man. And about that time the pulpit gave way. And he landed on the lap of a lady sitting in the front pew. And he was embarrassed. And he apologized profusely. But the woman said, No, no, it's my fault. You told me three times that you were coming. Um, We need to notice David's repetition. He wants us to understand that he is not proclaiming his own thoughts. He is not proclaiming his own wisdom. It's not David's insight. This is the sure and steadfast word that is on his tongue. It is the oracle of God that is proceeding from the sweet psalmist of Israel. And the message that David is giving us is that God's covenant is certain. God's covenant is sure and secure that the day is coming when a ruler will sit upon a throne and that ruler will be completely honest, completely just, completely righteous, and utterly fair. And one look at history, though, we look down through the ages and we know that uh, we would never think that such a thing is ever possible. We can look at our current circumstances here in the year 2020 and they do not serve to uh, bolster our hopes. A couple of weeks ago, the Democrats held their national convention. They put forth their platform and their vision for the future. The Republicans just finished their uh, convention. They set forth their vision and their platform. And if you look at it, it's basically polar opposites. You know, and depending on your political stripe, you know, this one's right and this one's wrong. You know, who is right? And, you know, how do we know? And David tells us here that there is no real lasting hope found in the the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, or the RNC, the Republican National Convention. Our only sure and lasting hope isn't in the DNC or the RNC. Instead, it's in the KOG which is the kingdom of God. That's our only sure and certain hope. God's kingdom isn't founded upon the uncertain rules and uncertain wisdom and political proposals of human beings. It's It's founded upon divine certainty and divine decrees. And the circumstances of this life, uh, you know, 2020 has taught us that it's forever changing. You know, things... Here in 2020, we thought, well, this will never change. We're always going to play football every fall. We're always going to be able to go where we want to go and do what we want to do. We won't have to do these things, but everything's changed, hasn't it? What we thought was certain and sure really wasn't certain and sure at all. And all it took to turn the world upside down was a microscopic virus. Beloved, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust that you have come to see that the only thing that is certain, the only thing that is sure, is the kingdom of God and the promises of the king. Now, I don't know about you, but I couldn't go on without that certainty. I I don't think I could live in this life with all of its little trials, with all of its little woes, and, you know, know, like a dead battery. That could just drive you crazy. Oh, Lord, just one more thing. You mean the Wi-Fi won't work? And it's interesting that Beth brought those up because I've experienced both of those in, within the last few weeks, you know. And it just seems like it's going to crush you. 
but it's just a little thing, but it's what we call that proverbial straw. But we have an unchanging God in this ever-changing world. To serve him, to honor him, to praise him, to worship him brings eternal security, eternal peace in the middle of whatever storm that's going on. We have that certainty. We have that sure and steadfast covenant promise that comes with the fact that there will one day be a king and the king is coming. Verses 3 and 4, David in verses 3 and 4 describes the king of this kingdom. David is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the middle of verse 3, we read, When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. In other words, that's what he's doing. He's waxing poetic. This is how he, this is what it's like. You know, when when the king comes, it's going to be like a beautiful morning. Can you picture it? You know, what I have in my mind is you get up one morning and it's absolutely gorgeous. The temperature is perfect. What's temperature? What's perfect temperature? In the upper 60s, not more than 71 degrees and no humidity to speak of, you know. And you're on your back porch or you're there in a mountain cabin and the sun is coming up on a cloudless morning and you have a hot cup of coffee, coffee in front of you and the birds begin to sing and it's just breathtaking. It's just breathtaking. Or David says it's like, I don't know, he talks about grass. I think of fresh mown grass like it's manicured on a golf course, how lush that is. I remember remember going to UT to Neyland Stadium the first time, and there was real grass there, and how beautiful it was. That's what it is. It's that overwhelming thing, that, that beauty. That grace, and David is describing an ideal kingship and the ideal king that rules with righteousness, with justice, with equity in the fear of the Lord. That's what he's talking about. He's certainly not talking about his own rule. He's not talking about his own reign because he has drifted. He is speaking as a prophet now. He's speaking of that ideal king who will rule with absolute justice and absolute fairness. And we long for that, don't we? We long for uh, such a king. Our hearts and our souls want a king like the one that David is describing here. Because we live in a world that's filled with injustice uh, and with injustice and unfairness and with rulers that are filled with deception and lies. People are marching in the streets now and they want, quote, social justice or they want this kind of justice or that kind of justice. And you don't read about different kinds of justice in the Bible. You just read about justice. God does not put an adjective in front of the word. There will just be justice and fairness. No more deception and no more lies from our rulers. And the rulers that we have in this world, whether they're dictatorships that have been imposed or whether they're elected like they are here in the United States, they are only concerned with looking out for themselves and their own glory and their own advancement and their own agenda and to line their own pockets. Uh, I think about China. And the government there wants to crush their people, and they are crushing their people, and they're seeking to crush the people of Hong Kong as well. I think about North Korea and Kim Jong-un, and he, uh, when he came to power, he executed North Korean officials to secure his place. He had his half-brother executed. He's been brought up on charges before the United Nations to, as uh, crimes against humanity. And in our own country, we can look at either party, either uh, nominee, Republican or Democratic, and it doesn't take long before you look at their lives to see immorality, corruption, and favoritism, and a hunger for power. And you know what I think all of that does? It makes me go, I wish it wasn't this way. Don't you? We, We long for this leader that is right and just and fair and honest honest and the corruption we see fills our soul with that deep longing and i think that's why people get so upset when you talk about politics Because there's this deep longing inside of them. There's this deep longing for justice, for righteousness. And we think it's going to be this way. And the other person thinks it's going to be this way. And we want it now. And David is saying one day, 
that longing will be fulfilled. One day the King of kings and the Lord of lords will return and he'll set up his kingdom and it will be an everlasting kingdom and there will be righteousness and justice and peace and it will dwell there and, the, and it will be a kingdom whose king is perfect and pure. That's what David is saying. The Apostle John wrote about this kingdom in Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. That's what we long for, isn't it? That's what we desire. And the king of this kingdom, our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, he, um, he says what he means, and he means what he says. His word is his bond. When he promises something, he keeps his promise. That's our king. Verse 5, David writes, Does not my house stand so with God? For he has made me with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things. Again, he's referring back to that covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the covenant that God made with him and, the, and with his house, with his family, a covenant that's described as an everlasting covenant and a covenant that will go on forever, the covenant of love that the Lord will never remove. And there's a temporal aspect to that covenant, and there's an eternal aspect to that covenant. And David's pondering all that. He's thinking about all that. And God, what, he's thinking about what God has done through with him and through his family, his household. And so there's that temporal aspect with the eternal aspect. Aspect. God has promised David that there were his son will sit upon the throne and that his son his grandson will sit upon the throne. That is the earthbound, that is the temporary. But at the same time, he says, Your throne will be established forever. That's eternal. How can his throne be established forever? Well, if you know your Bible and you read your Bible, who is in the bloodline of our Savior Jesus Christ? David. David, Christ is great David's greater son. His kingdom, Jesus Christ's kingdom, will be forever. His kingdom will never, ever end. So God has made this covenant promise, and at the heart of the promise is something that will never end. It will last forever. And David, as he's writing his, quote, last words, he's drawing his strength from this covenant promise. He's resting in the assurance that when God makes a covenant, when God makes a promise, it can never be broken. That's what he's saying is that God's word is secure. God's covenant is steadfast. It can never be broken. Now, let's just hit the pause button here for a moment and think about who's writing this. What have we learned about David over the past few weeks. Think about his life. He started out so well, didn't he? He started out well, but then he failed. He faltered. Adultery with Bathsheba, the murder of her husband Uriah, his failures in raising his kids, and now David is writing his last words, and they seem so confident. How can he be sure? How can he be certain in light of all of his past sins? How can he be sure about the future? How can he face the end of his life and have peace and have security? Because of the covenant. Because he is in covenant relationship with his God. And when you're in a covenant relationship with God, you stand justified in his presence. And nothing can separate you from him, not your sins. Paul writes, not, light, not height, nor depth, nor death itself, nor any other created thing can ever separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Not our failures. Why? Because God saw all of your sins. He saw all of your failures before you ever committed even one of them. And then God, in eternity past, made a covenant 
He made a covenant to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of our sins. And he sealed that covenant with the blood of his own son upon the cross. And all who join in that covenant by grace through faith will be a part of this everlasting and eternal kingdom of his son. Are you in a covenant relationship with God by grace through faith through his son, Jesus Christ? If not, where will your comfort come from when, you're, when it's time for your last words? When it's time for your last words, where will your security and peace be founded? What will it be founded upon? Will it come from within yourself and all of the good things that you've done? Well, is that where it comes from, from your accomplishments, from your church attendance? Will your last words as you stand before God on judgment day, will they be, look what I've done, Lord. Look how great I am. David is saying here that he finds comfort and security in God. He's saying my comfort and security isn't in me. My security lies on the solid rock of the covenant that God has made with me, a word, a bond that God has made. David is saying that his salvation is outside of himself. The world tells us today, look look within. Everything you need is inside of you. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that the heart is deceitful. The heart is wicked. The heart will turn Will, will will lead you to God's judgment because you see our righteousness, our good deeds, all of those things are nothing but filthy rags before God Almighty. There is no salvation found in the human heart. There is no inherent goodness within us that will ever merit salvation. What did Jesus say from within? Out of the heart of human beings proceed lies, adultery, All of these things. And what David is saying is he is not looking inside of himself. He is looking outside of himself to the God, the covenant God of grace and of salvation. He's looking to the covenant that was made with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do you see that? Do you see what David is saying? He's saying it the way that... Uh, Augustus Toplady said it in this hymn, Rock of Ages. He sang, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul to the fountain I fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. That's what he's saying. It was at that fountain that this perfect king, our Lord and Savior, and that fountain, I believe, is the cross of, our, of Christ, the cross that our king would take upon himself. Because you see, in a covenant, when he made the covenant, there are covenant, there are blessings and there are curses with a covenant. Blessings and curses. And the blessing is the blessing of being in the everlasting covenant, the everlasting king, kingdom, and the curse is to face the wrath and judgment of God. And Jesus took the curse upon himself, upon the cross. That's why the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. He took that curse upon himself so that we, by grace through faith, might stand in the presence of God. He, we are covenant breakers. And Christ was a covenant keeper. And Christ, the covenant keeper, stood in our place. And we, by grace, can accept, by faith, can accept what he's done for us. And we will be seen as a covenant keeper and not a covenant breaker. Finally, and lastly, in verses 6 and 7, David reminds us that in the kingdom of God, there will be those that are inside the kingdom and those that are outside of the kingdom. Some people don't want anything to do with the righteousness of of Christ with the righteous reign of the King of Kings. Verse 6 refers to them, and this is the King, uh, the King James Version, it refers to them as the sons of Belial. And Belial is the devil, the sons of the devil. The son, they are worthless men, they are godless men, and such people, they have no part in the kingdom of God. I know that's not a popular way to express things these, day, these days, but I'm not here to be popular. 
I'm here to preach the truth. And the truth is what God is saying here. Verse 6 tells us that these people are like thorns that are thrown away. Verse 7, they will be gathered up with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they are utterly consumed with fire. These worthless people, the godless people, they're like briars and thorns. If you've ever cleaned out a fence row, it's those briars and those thorns like from a fence row. You put them in a pile, and what do you do with them? You don't save them. You burn them. The coming of the kingdom involves both restoration and destruction. It involves salvation and it involves judgment. Christ the king will come and purge from his kingdom those who, won't know, who, who, who do not want any part of his righteousness. At that moment, on judgment day, it will be perfectly clear. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 13. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I wonder if Jesus had Second Samuel 23 in mind as he was preaching about weeds being gathered up and burned with fire. And I hope that you can see the grace in this message. The grace is, is that the truth of the gospel is you can be in the kingdom. That's grace. God does not have to save us. God did not have to come and die for our sins in, the, in his son Jesus Christ. And it's grace that you are told that there are blessings in the covenant and that there are curses in the covenant. You know, Jesus preaching here, I wonder if he's talking about that reality, the reality that of all that all, that the, of the fact that all who are not in covenant covenant relationship with him by grace through faith, they will be judged. They will face the wrath of God, and that's the reality. And what could be more loving and more gracious and more kind than to tell you the truth? The truth. So where are you this morning? Where is your security? Are you looking inside of yourself or are you looking to Jesus? Are you building your house on the sand or are you building it upon the rock of salvation, Jesus Christ? Where are you building? Are you trusting in Christ and Christ alone? Inside Christ and his covenant kingdom, there is mercy, there is forgiveness, and there is grace. Outside of him, outside of the kingdom, there is wrath and there is judgment. There is fire. Let us pray. Father, on the cross, your son took our place. He took the punishment that we deserve. May we look to him and him alone for the salvation that only he can give. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.